Hey, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our session. Uh, my name is Lin Song. I'm a research engineer from IBM Research. So this will be a uh, use case session, so you won't really see any code in this session. But hopefully, you will like this. So for today's topic, I will uh, talk about how we leverage RE, uh, specifically RE workflow, in our effort around foundation models or large language models. So the two keywords here today are foundation models and uh, RE workflow. So let's get started. So we have a very simple agenda today. So I will start with some brief uh, introduction around foundation models. Then I will talk about one important effort we've been doing around foundation model, which is to build the, uh, what we call scale out middleware. And I will also talk about how Ray fit into the picture. Uh, lastly, I will do a little bit deep dive into how exactly why we think Ray workflow is helpful and how we leverage Ray workflow around this effort. OK, so to start with, what is foundation model? What are foundation models? I think some of us might not uh, hear this term before, but very likely you've been using foundation models in the past. So basically, foundation models are essentially large pre-trained models that can be fine-tuned to a variety of different downstream tasks. So I think nowadays, the most common examples are really large language models. You know, you know, those things we heard all the time, like BERT, Ruberta, T5, GPT-3. You know, it's essentially large models that are pre-trained to understand something in general rather than a very specific task, which you can just later on fine tune it for various of different downstream tasks. Uh, well, nowadays when people talk about foundation models, the, uh, like many of them, just, they just mean uh, large language models. But essentially, foundation models are much more beyond that. So they are essentially foundation models that are built or being built in all various of domains. Uh, that's a very quick introduction on what are foundation models. So foundation models has been a very important uh, piece uh, within IBM research this year. And uh, one of the major efforts we've been working on is to build this thing called scale out middleware. So this is a pretty simplified version of our end-to-end -end stack for uh, building our foundation models. So uh, we can take a look at this from bottom up. So on the very bottom part, that is our, that is where our uh, infra are. So, you know, things like hardware is where our, our uh, you know, GPUs, clusters are. Uh, slightly on top of that, that is our uh, cloud platform. So uh, we've been uh, leveraging Red Hat OpenShift, which is uh, the commercial version of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, as our hybrid cloud platform. Uh, here I won't go into uh, details, but basically we leverage this to enable us to run anything anywhere in a hybrid cloud fashion. So uh, typically these two things can already form a stack. So you can already run your application code on top of that. But we find that our users and our researchers, the had many headaches when they start working on foundation models, when they start working on like large models. So I can give two quick examples. For example, many of our users or researchers, they start their V0 model scratch from their local, from their favorite uh, like uh, Jupyter notebook environment, right? So it might be easier for them to just scale that on uh, a single GPU or a single node with multiple GPU, but they often find uh, some headaches when they try to deploy that on a large cluster that has many nodes, each node has many GPUs. Uh, another headache would be uh, data ingestion pipeline. So uh, again, foundation models are large, huge models, which also requires huge volume of input data to train. So it's not something you can just download to your local, download to your node, run your you know, data curation pipeline there. You need to really build a pipeline, build a efficient pipeline that can process uh, input data batch by batch in a very efficient manner. So that's also one of the headaches. So really, we want to build this middleware so it is uh, 
cloud native and fully customized stack that enable our users and researchers to really uh, be able to do something like, hey, this is my model built from a notebook. Just take this, and uh, I don't care how your cluster look like. Just take this, run this on a, let's say, 10 nodes, each with eight GPUs. Then we should be able to just do that for them. So this is just a little bit zoomed version of the previous slide, the upper part. So basically, at the core, we've been leveraging uh, Ray and Torch to, uh, to do this. So we are leveraging a uh, Torch portfolio to do everything that is training specific. Uh, uh, training specific. And we've been leveraging Ray, uh, specifically Ray workflow, to do anything that is pre-training and after training. For example, uh, after the fine tuning, how do we do uh, evaluation? We will talk more about this later. Okay, so uh, before I talk about how real uh, workflow helps, I think uh, despite, I think all of us are pretty familiar with re, uh, since this is re submit. Uh, but I think re workflow as a beta feature or beta branch of re might be still new to some of us. So I would like to just use one minute to quickly talk about re workflow. So Ray workflow is basically a durable layer on top of uh, Ray core or Ray task, uh, whichever you prefer to call that. And uh, computation, it is powered by Ray core task, while it adds this durable storage layer for checkpointing purpose. Uh, it has many more, but the core part is basically it is powered by Ray task, and it is backed by physical storage uh, for checkpointing purpose. Here, the storage can be your local storage, can be your NFS, it can be S3, things like that. And uh, we think re workflow, because of this, re workflow compared to the re core task, it provides actually better support for uh, production level, large scale, and long running workflows. Again, I won't go into any details on re workflow spec, but uh, there was a very good session yesterday. So, in case you missed that, uh, I have the full link here. Basically, it's a deep dive into re workflow that is presented by Re team. Okay. So, foundation model with re workflow. I think to really understand why we think re workflow helps in our foundation model of pipeline and how it helps. I think it's better to understand better on uh, how foundation model pipeline looks like and how it is different from a regular small model training or evaluation pipeline. So here I have two very simplified version of pipeline for both training stage and fine tuning stage. So from here, you will see it's just as simple as any other small data training as well. You always start with some data collection, you go to data pre-processing, you go to model training, and at the end you have maybe hyperparameter tuning. So same thing for fine tuning. But let's look at some of the properties that maybe only large model have or only large models that suffer. So I think the first one is multi-stage and long running. So uh, again, the upper part is the simplified version. So it's a data gathering and data curation. But if you break down each one of them, it, is actually contain, it, it actually contains many small steps. So here I'm giving an example of the data curation pipelining steps for T5 model. These steps were from the original T5 paper. So as you can see, although it's only a data curation Step, but it is actually a very. It actually contains many small steps, and these small steps chain together. So one problem is, so let's see. Uh, since uh, again, foundation models are large models, so the input data volume is also huge. So we are talking about sometimes it could be it could take days to fully pass all your data. So what if right uh, your uh, only portion of your batches of data is finished? when your system is done. Or even what if, let's see, uh, you go to maybe middle of the mini st steps and suddenly your system is done. Do you have to restart from the very, uh, the very scratch of that batch of data or you can somehow magically 
just restart from the exact mini, mini step here. So that's one issue or problem that we have to solve. So another thing is uh, resource allocation and data locality. Here I'm using the simplified version of uh, fine tuning. So fine tuning usually starts with some domain data pre-processing and gathering, followed by HAP filtering. Uh, HAP filtering, uh, for those of us who are not familiar with this, so this step basically you pass your data to a model. So there is a profanity check model. So it's, this step is essentially a model inferencing. You pass your data to that model and that model will give you a score. So you can leverage that score to decide if you want to remove uh, those sentences for profanity check. And uh, lastly, we have uh, our fine tuning, which is also model training. So as you could see, these three steps are essentially using very different resources. Data preprocessing is CPU bound, so you want to allocate as many CPUs as possible, and you don't need GPUs here. For HAP filtering, it, since it's a model inferencing, here it's a small model, it's a very efficient, fast inferencing, so you actually only need one single GPU and one node to do that. So you don't want to allocate one node to do that while maybe most of the GPUs inside that node are idle. And for the last part training here, you know, we just want as many nodes as possible, as many GPUs as possible. So how can you do resource allocation in a proper fashion? How can you efficiently leverage all your resources? And also, very importantly, how can you achieve max data locality? So minimal amount of data is, has to be transferred between nodes or between GPUs. So the, uh, the third property is what we call reusable workflow and massive parallel. So uh, again, let's go back to uh, maybe this part. If you look at the upper part, it looks like for the fine tuning stage, it looks like one workflow, but it is essentially tons of workflows that can be run in parallel because for each fine tuning job, they actually leverage or they require very different domain data. So the domain data pre-processing is very different. The hyperparameter selection is very different. The fine tuning, you know, you train on different data and model serving, you serve different model based on uh, the very specific task. So although it looks like one workflow, but it is essentially one template of workflow that you will keep reusing. You will have a bunch of different copies that each fade into different data and goes into different pipeline. Okay, so uh, I think to summarize a little bit, so uh, I think foundation model pipeline, uh, due to the you know due to the volume of the input data as well as the complexity of the model itself, it naturally has these features. It is a multi-stage, long-running pipeline which requires very efficient resource allocation. And uh, also we need a certain template to be able to reuse the same workflow multiple times. So I think uh, I won't go into too much detail on this slide, but basically with all these issues or questions, we've been started looking at re-workflow and uh, checking all various uh, features from Rigflow to see how Rigflow re-workflow could help and could support all of this. So this is what we've been currently leveraging re-workflow to sort of like help each of these. So to start with, uh, remember why, uh, this, uh, why I introduced uh, re-workflow one uh, important feature they have is reworkflow provides this graph layer. They provide a DAG layer. So because of that, it's naturally a very good way you can pipeline different tasks together. So unlike regular re-core, where you really need to do uh, chain remote on many different steps, here you can actually build a, a, build a graph. It can be you know two steps nested with each other. They all go to the third step. Then you know, th uh, no matter how complex the graph is, you can always build the graph first. And also because of this, it, it naturally solves the problem of the last one, which is reusable workflow, because once you have a graph layer, you are essentially having a template. So you can basically reuse the same graph 
but feeding in different input data and feeding in different configurations. So it's the same template for different workflows. So another thing we've been using uh, quite uh, a bit is re really re-workflows checkpointing uh, uh, capability. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, for large volume of input pipeline, it could contain dozens of steps. So we want our system to be able to say, hey, uh, my system could go down, uh, my pod could die, my node could fail, even my cluster could, uh, you know, for whatever reason, my cluster can be down. But I want to be able to do this. So once my pod is back, once my node is back, once my cluster is back, I want to be able to recover from exactly where I left. So from the exact mini, mini step rather than, you know, from the, outer step or even f start the whole batch from scratch. So that is where we leverage reworkflows checkpointing. And uh, we use IBM COS, which is essentially our version of S3, to really checkpoint all those results. So whatever the system, uh, so whichever level of the system failed, it can always pick up from exactly where it left. And uh, in terms of long running, we leverage the uh, sort of like the collaboration of reworkflow's own fault tolerance and our cluster's fault tolerance. So this is done by by installing a re operator in our cluster because OpenShift cluster is uh, essentially also a Kubernetes uh, cluster. So by doing these two together, we are able to achieve fault tolerance on all various of uh, levels of failures. Uh, resource allocation, I think I don't need to talk too much because recore retask also has this per task resource allocation. I'm sure you know uh, this. Uh, we are all very familiar with that. So and since reworkflow is powered by retask, so naturally reworkflow with with reworkflow we can also do very precise per task resource allocation. Okay. So uh, we are actually also very proud to see that we've been collaborating very well with Ray team, and in this case, specifically Ray workflow team. So we've been, uh, in the past, we've been keep exchanging valuable feedbacks. We've been addressing some of the issues together. And here I list a few of them that uh, Ray team or Re workflow team has been actively helping us to uh, resolve based on our feedbacks. So for example, for the DAG layer, Re already has a pretty good observability, but for the graph layer, wouldn't it be even nice, nicer to have the observability on a graph layer? So you know exactly from your graph, you know exactly which step is your bottleneck or which step is consuming more time than the, than the rest and exactly which step that has failed which will need to be recovered. So another thing is selective checkpointing. So checkpoint, checkpointing is a good thing, it's, as always is a good thing. But sometimes checkpointing, since you need to checkpoint to your disk or even to a cloud storage, that also adds much of the overhead in your computation graph. So being able to selective do checkpoint is also very important because for some of the steps, it is, might be easier to just rerun the step rather than you know, write, the, write the step output to your disk and reload from that, right? So we also want to achieve selective checkpointing. This is also a uh, re-workflow team has been uh, helping us achieve by uh, you know, hearing our feedbacks. Uh, yes, yeah, that's uh, pretty much um, you know, uh, the high level of how we leverage re-workflow in our uh, foundation model pipeline, and more specifically, it's around our pre-training and post-training. Actually, I only have one slide left. So this is currently how it looks like. So as I mentioned, the model training part, we are still leveraging uh, the portfolio of, of Torch, but for both pre-training and after training, we actually have designed very well-working re-workflows. So the re-workflow will take, take care of everything from model gathering and collection all the way to right before model training. 
So here, as you can see, the workflow is actually also interfere a little bit on the training part. That is because we also include workflow for the uh, tokenization part. So a small portion of the model training is also wrapped into real workflow for checkpointing and uh, fault tolerance purpose. And uh, for model fine tuning, we've been also leveraging real workflow to wrap everything together to achieve a fault tolerance pipelining for uh, model fine tuning. And at the end, we have the model serving. So this is how our current foundation model pipeline looks like. Okay, I think we have almost 10 minutes left. It's great. Okay, uh, okay, I think, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the foundation models, as we call it here, or large language models, um, they are usually pre-trained, mm -hmm. right? So let's say I have a use case. I want to fine-tune that model. Okay. Um, from what I understand, fine-tuning is you are taking few layers at the bottom of the uh, stack, right? And uh, fine-tuning even new, new, new data set. Mm -hmm. your use case data set. So if you can just elaborate a little bit more about uh, what's the, like looking at the array use case, mm -hmm. how would I go about doing that? Maybe a use case example. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, so I think one key, I would say, property of uh, fine tuning is, uh, so, so again, here I'm talking about model evaluation, meaning that it's not really we fine tune on one specific task. So here we are actually fine tuning on hundreds of different tasks because we need our model evaluation performance number on many different tasks, right? Q we want to see how it performs on Q&A, want to see how it performs on sentiment analysis. Each guy, each guy is an example, right? Yes, yes, yes. So in this case, what we really do is we just build one single workflow. It's a one single DAG. And uh, we leave the input data and input configuration outside our DAG. So that what, what we do is for all these hundreds of fine tuning, we actually use a single workflow, but each time we feed in very different data and very different configuration. So it, we could, this is what we mean by using reusable workflow, a single uh, DAG layer as a template, which can do hundreds of different fine tuning tasks on different things, okay. yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that some some of the intermediate uh, step, uh, storage could be big for checkpointing, perhaps too big yes. to checkpoint, yes, right? Yes, uh, yes, Sometimes even infeasible. But I'm wondering how do you track, say a model has this input, this input too large to store, and then we have a model checkpoint, say at the epoch, certain epoch, a certain example number. But oh. the, even though you know which input you will need for next, but since that input is not stored, it's generated by previous steps, all the way trading, if you want to rerun, how do you know which uh, original data, which are, where the mark is? That's a good question. So actually for the checkpointing here, we only leverage real workflow for all the checkpointing before training. So during training, the checkpointing stuff is we are still leveraging uh, the checkpointing from Torch. So the checkpointing we are talking about here is only for uh, let's say you have a sentence that has to go to three different stage of cleaning. So what if, you know, after the second stage, my cluster is done? So I want to be able to do when my cluster come back, I want to resume exactly from the finish of step two rather than all the way from step zero. So that's actually where we leverage workflows checkpointing. But once it goes into the actual model training, we no longer use that. We are actually using a PyTorch's own, uh, own uh, checkpointing. So at that stage, is, there's no more uh, workflow checkpointing. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, 
Hi, I'm, um, I'm interested about the, the last slide that you showed, if you could get to that. Uh, yeah, here. So um, you're showing that the, you're using the Ray workflow up until a little bit of model training. Mm -hmm. I'm interested about the model serving side. Uh, could you talk more about what you're doing on model serving, and have you considered Ray for, for any of that? So at this stage, we uh, haven't used Reserve for model serving yet. Uh, we've been mostly leveraging uh, our uh, mesh model serving. Uh, and uh, this part is uh, currently, is we, I believe we only use uh, our first party uh, in-house serving tool yet. Uh, yes, but basically in short, we haven't really used reserve for model serving yet. But in short, in this part, what we do is essentially we perform uh, some sort of uh, model quantization. Uh, and uh, if you know f the model is too large with foundation model, we will also shard the model properly, maybe across different nodes or, uh, or across different GPUs. And uh, we also internally, we have uh, various of different ways to do uh, mesh uh, model serving. Yeah, so uh, we've been uh, mostly leveraging uh, the thing called uh, KeyServe. So, and internally we've been uh, developed this model serving, is, uh, which is, uh, I don't know too much details on that, but it's basically a mesh-based model serving. But if you are interested in that, we actually, for that part, we actually contribute back to the open source KeyServe part. So, under the open source case sub repo, there's a subfolder mesh something. So that's exactly what we developed and contributed back to the community. So, so where to look for it? Model mesh? And this is a project that was used internally, largely used in production in IBM and a number of services, which we have contributed to the case server as open source. Hi, I'm Fred from IBM. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Think of it as your your serving uh, request is going into a mesh, so it's not just like a single endpoint. It goes gets routed across into multiple of them, and depending on which one is free, it'll get rerouted. And uh, because ultimately it's all meant to be providing uh, SLA guarantees in terms of um, uh, latencies, because all our like for example our assistant uh, service uses model mesh in the background, and we have to provide. I don't know, like tens of milliseconds uh, uh, latencies SLAs for whenever somebody types something in the chat, response has to come back within a few tens of milliseconds. And uh, the model mesh, because of its nature of spreading the load across, knowing where to route the request, depending on which ones are readily available and whatnot, all of those it takes into account and it's not a single endpoint or you're not doing a load, simple load balancing. It's like a mesh kind of a load balancing that allows you to route the request to the right place, which is available, can address the latency request. Okay, if not, uh, we're thanks also for on top oh. of time. <laughs> Say what? No, oh, we are also on top of the time now. Ah, perfect. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Thank you.